On May 17, 2018, after a nearly three-month trial, jurors found Jeffrey Pike and John Portillo guilty of conspiring to conduct the affairs of a criminal organization through racketeering acts including directing, sanctioning, approving and permitting members of the banditos to commit murder, attempted murder, robbery, assault, intimidation, extortion and drug trafficking. Evidence during trial revealed that in 2006, Pike and Portillo ordered other Bandidos members to murder Anthony Benish. At the time, Benish was attempting to start a Texas chapter of the Hells Angels in Austin. Members of the Bandidos warned Benish to cease his activities and recruitment, which Benish ignored. Several Bandidos members then murdered Benish on March 18, 2006 outside an Austin restaurant to protect the power, reputation and territory of the Bandidos enterprise. So, who are the Bandidos? Well, the Bandidos Outlaws Motorcycle Club is an international motorcycle club with approximately 1,100 members worldwide. Members of the club describe it as a 1% motorcycle club, a designation that signifies loyalty, brotherhood, and commitment. Johnny Romo, a member of the Bandidos, explained at trial that the 1% term means that we're above all the other clubs. Though there are other 1% motorcycle clubs in the country, the Bandidos consider themselves the most dominant. The Bandidos use a variety of symbols to identify themselves to one another and to outsiders. Members of the club wear a three-piece patch, which includes an emblem of a cartoon character known as the Fat Mexican. In the emblem, the character is depicted holding a semi-automatic pistol and a machete. The bottom section of the patch, known as the bottom rocker, identifies the territory that each Bandido is going to claim. In Texas, for example, the bottom rocker indicates that a member belongs to a Texas-based chapter. The Bandidos closely guard the integrity of the bottom rocker and only allow full members of the club to wear the three-piece patch. Before becoming an official member, prospects can join support clubs, which are a stepping stone to get closer to the Bandidos. Once an individual becomes a full member, he has patched in. Though the Bandidos have chapters across the world, the club has a particularly strong presence in Texas. The club was founded in March 1966 in San Leon, Texas. At the time of trial, there were between 35 and 40 Bandidos chapters in Texas, with about 400 Bandidos members statewide. The Bandidos is the only major 1% motorcycle club in Texas. The Bandidos maintain a highly organized management structure. Several national officers are responsible for organizing regular events, including an annual summer run and a spring birthday run. Local chapters are self-governing and largely autonomous, though they are required to pay dues to the national office to support the cost of the group's events. The national office includes a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and several sergeants at arms. In addition to organizing events, national officers control the selection and distribution of patches. Patches are often distributed to acknowledge a member's sacrifices on behalf of the club. Jeffrey Pike served as national president of the Bandidos from 2005 until 2016. Pike assumed this role after the group's former president, George Wiggers, pleaded guilty to a RICO conspiracy. According to George Wiggers, who was the Bandidos president from 1998 until his arrest in 2005, had his Bandidos patches revoked by his successor, Pike, because Wiggers appeared in a report about the club. Pike was like, we don't do interviews. We don't do TV, Wiggers testified, recalling a conversation he said he had with Pike in 2012. It was a patch pull offense. According to law enforcement, the Bandidos president, also known as El Presidente, has full authority to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Some members of the Bandidos refer to the president's role as a dictatorship. Pike disputed this characterization and testified that the individual chapters run themselves. Pike also testified that it was his goal as president to make the group more mainstream and more family-oriented than it had been under Uyghurs' leadership. In 2002, John Portillo was promoted from local chapter president of the San Antonio Bandidos chapter to National Sergeant at Arms. In that position, Portillo was responsible for protecting the group's national officers and managing relationships between local chapters and rival clubs. Pike selected Portillo as National Vice President, or El Vice Presidente, in 2013. The Vice President's purpose was to provide the President with plausible deniability. In one recorded conversation introduced at trial, Portillo explained that he thought of himself as Jeff's guy. I'm here to protect Pike. I'm gonna protect him from the effing bullshit that's going on. In another wiretap conversation, Portillo was recorded explaining that he don't make no majors without Pike knowing about it. During trial, talk of murder, drugs and sex permeated through the testimony of an insider. 
The insider was not a former Bandidos member, but a 46-year-old woman who testified that she helped the Bandidos murder a man named Robert Lara. Robert Lara was a member of the 2-6 Nation gang. Her testimony largely implicated Portillo. Winans, a former meth addict, said she was introduced to the Bandidos in 2001 through a friend, the late boxer, Robert Pekin Quiroga. Keep him in mind. Anyway, she said she met Richard Merla and Andrew Corky Gomez, a member of the Bandidos Southwest San Antonio chapter, and had an affair with Gomez. She even went to work in his auto shop. She also managed the club's call girl service, playmate escorts, out of an apartment on Cincinnati Avenue, where customers were charged $200 an hour. She said some of the money went to Portillo. Winans also testified that she broke up methamphetamine for Gomez for distribution and even delivered ounce quantities to Portillo. At the end of 2001, she heard through Gomez that fellow chapter member, Javier J. Negretti, was fatally shot at Tiffany's Billiards off San Pedro Avenue. Gomez introduced her to the boss, Portillo. Portillo asked her, Do you think you can take care of this for us? Our brother meant a lot to us. She agreed. After being given an alias, she infiltrated the 2-6 Nation gang and befriended Lara, who confessed he killed Negretti. When she reported back to the Bandidos, they instructed Winans to lure Lara to a desolate picnic area along Interstate 37 south of San Antonio. There, Merla and fellow Bandidos member, Frederick Fast Fred Cortez, waited for Portillo to give them the order. When they got the okay, they pulled Lara out of the car and shot him repeatedly, she testified. They did not stay on the scene to see if Lara was moving or if he was dead or alive. They got back in their truck and drove to the home of Portillo's brother, who was a member of a Bandidos support club. Lara was later found dead by the police with at least 12 bullet wounds. When Merla next spoke with Portillo, Portillo told him that he could never talk about Lara's murder. Merla gave Portillo the gun used to shoot Lara, and Portillo burned it with a torch. Merla and the other bandidos were awarded, expect no mercy patches, which were intended to honor members who drew blood or shed blood for the club. Winans assumed the same fate awaited her. But instead, the club hailed her and the killing also earned Portillo a promotion in May 2002 to the national chapter, as a national sergeant at arms. Before he was promoted, Portillo told her, we'll make sure you're taken care of. He said, we can make you property, and if anything happens to you, it happens to us, Winans testified. She said she agreed with his request to get a tattoo. The tattoo on her hip once read, property of BMC SWSA, Bandidos Motorcycle Club Southwest San Antonio Chapter and was designed to look like the patches bandidos wear on their vests, she said. After Lara's murder, law officers tried to interview her three times about the killing. In June 2002, when she was jailed for traffic ticket warrants, Portillo bailed her out and she lied to police by saying she knew nothing about Lara's murder. When the feds arrested Portillo in January 2016 and searched his home, they found a receipt for what Portillo paid for Winans' bail. Prosecutors showed it to the jury during Winans' testimony. Winans also was arrested in January 2006 for possession of 7 grams of meth. She said Portillo her not to worry, to just go with the plan. Don't change your lies pretty much, and that a lawyer paid by the banditos will take care of you. A year later, she was arrested again for possession of marijuana. The feds, who were investigating the banditos, later adopted the state drug charges. Rather than go with the banditos lawyer, she chose a federal public defender because she wanted the opportunity to live a structured life. As part of a plea deal, she pleaded guilty to a federal misdemeanor for possession of meth and got probation with a requirement for drug treatment and rehab. For her cooperation, she was not charged for Lara's murder, she said. As far as the tattoo though, she later covered it up with a larger tattoo. This happened after her friend Robert Quiroga was killed by Richard Merla in 2004 and she stopped being the club's property. Two years after Robert Lara was shot and killed, Richard Merla was arrested for killing Robert Quiroga. Robert Quiroga was the International Boxing Federation Super Flyweight Champion from 1990 to 1993. Quiroga successfully defended his title five times and retired in 1995. He finished with 20-2 with 11 KOs. Quiroga was the first world champion from San Antonio, Texas. On August 16, 2004, Richard Merla was playing cards with Quiroga. A dispute arose concerning a Scarface poster that Merla had taken from one of Quiroga's friends. Merla stabbed Quiroga later that night, and Quiroga subsequently died on the scene. When Portillo found out that Merla was linked to the killing, he was expelled from the club. Quiroga's death brought unwanted attention, so a press release was sent out stating that Merla acted on his own. While he was in jail, 
Merla confessed to killing Lara in 2002 and implicated Portillo in Lara's murder. On cross-examination, Portillo's counsel attacked Merla's credibility, suggesting that he implicated Portillo only because he was angry at him for expelling him from the Bandidos. Portillo also suggested that Merla's memory was unreliable and that there were inconsistencies between his in-court testimony and his prison confession. During the government's redirect of Merla, the court allowed the government to introduce Merla's confession as a prior consistent statement. In his one-page confession, Merla stated that the murder of Robert Lara was planned and executed by Chapter President John Portillo of the Southwest Chapter of Bandidos. In 2005, Anthony Benish and his friend Carl Burford decided that they wanted to start the first Hells Angels chapter in Texas. Hells Angels, another 1% motorcycle club, had chapters across the United States, but not in Texas. Benish got a Hells Angels tattoo on his back, painted his motorcycle red and white, and began wearing a motorcycle vest and jacket with an emblem that matched his tattoo. The patch on his vest identified him as vice president of the Hells Angels. Burford testified that he traveled to Arizona to meet with Sonny Barger, the national president of the Hells Angels, to get approval to start a Texas chapter. Barger denied this account, claiming that he would not have had the authority to approve a new Hells Angels chapter. Regardless, Benish and Burford's actions quickly provoked anger from the Bandidos. Burford tried to avoid conflict by limiting his use of the Hells Angels vest, but Benish regularly wore his patch around Austin. Benish's girlfriend testified that Benish started receiving threatening calls about his display of the Hells Angels patch. Johnny Romo, a Bandidos member, testified that he learned about Benish from Portillo. Portillo told him that there were two Hells Angels riding their bikes in Austin. He explained that members of the local Austin chapter had tried everything to fix the problem, including threats, intimidation, and fear. At the time, Portillo and Johnny were both sergeants at arms for the Bandidos National Office. Portillo told Johnny that Pike had personally directed them to take out Benish and Burford. Johnny testified that Portillo told him this came from Jeff Pike, we need to take them out. Johnny interpreted this order to mean that Portillo and Pike wanted him to kill Benish, to get rid of him. Johnny explained that the club wanted to stop Benish and Burford because there shouldn't be no other one percenters but the Bandidos in Texas. Johnny testified that Portillo told him to assemble a group of Bandidos members and go to Austin. Johnny picked a few people he trusted to accompany him, including Robbie Romo, his brother. At the time, Robbie was a prospective member of the Bandidos who had not yet patched in. The day before the murder, Johnny and the other men drove from San Antonio to Austin to look for Benish. They stayed outside Benish's house until dusk, and then drove home to San Antonio. They returned to Austin the following day, and Robbie brought a rifle with him. Norberto Cerna Jr., also known as Hammer, was also part of the hit crew. Cerna was one time the president of the club's Centro San Antonio chapter. Anyway, they drove to Benish's house, waited until he exited, then followed him and his family to a restaurant, where they parked outside. About an hour later, Johnny saw Benish coming out of the restaurant and alerted Robbie. Robbie got his rifle ready by positioning it outside of the passenger's side window, aimed it at the driver's side of Benish's truck, and shot the back of Benish's head. You can see Benish's girlfriend and sons running for help. Benish was dead when the police arrived. Benish's girlfriend told the officers that she had warned Benish not to set up a Hells Angels chapter here. Johnny and the crew quickly fled the scene and immediately called Portillo from a payphone to tell him, it's done. When Johnny saw Pike a few months later, Pike gave him a hug and a kiss and told him that he was very proud of him. After the murder, Robbie, who was a prospect at the time of the shooting, was allowed to patch in early. Johnny was permitted to start an underground chapter of the Bandidos, the fat Mexican crew, which answered directly to Pike. Johnny and the crew also received Expect No Mercy patches, which were intended to honor members who drew blood or shed blood for the club. In addition to all this information, there was some hostile business involving the Cossacks. The Cossacks are a motorcycle club based in North Texas. In 2014, Pike gave the Cossacks permission to add a Texas bottom rocker symbol to their patch. Pike believed this was a natural transition for the club, and he hoped that the gesture would open a line of communication between the two clubs. Eventually, however, the Bandidos became concerned that the Cossacks were displaying the bottom rocker in a disrespectful manner. Portillo told Johnny, we're not going to yef around with them Cossacks, dude, it's on. Justin Forster testified that he heard Portillo tell Pike that the group had to do what we got to do to deal with the Cossacks. Pike responded, whatever y'all do, just be careful. The government introduced evidence pertaining to several violent altercations between the Cossacks and the Bandidos. 
but we will get into that when we do a more in-depth Bandidos vs. Cossacks story. In the end, Portillo got two life sentence plus 20 years, and Pike got life plus 10 years. Norberto, who accompanied the Romo brothers, got 21 years. He didn't cooperate with the government so he didn't get leniency. Johnny Romo was facing life in prison, but cooperated by testifying against other members of the Bandidos. This resulted in a 15-year sentence. Robert Romo also testified and received 18 years. This ends today's story. Please like, comment, and subscribe.